realities, prompting us to revisit the drawing of the world. We consider shifting economic situations. And we challenge your strengthening capacities in the pursuit of clean energy. We open our minds to the fruits of innovation. And what new and exciting forms knowledge can take. and our better understanding of how to care for its needs. We work our way past the constraints of geography, across borders through meaningful, goal-driven collaborations, bound by the sheer desire to get to the bigger picture, to an image of a future where all cities are livable, with access to renewable energy, to an image of equality enjoyed by all, to an image where we no longer fear the depletion of resources and are comforted instead by its growth, to an image of our children living through the best of the planet and not its worst. This is the image of the future we want, where all the best things about our future's clean energy are products of hands held together. This is what it means to partner for impact. It's about creating the future that we picture together. Good morning. Good morning, guests. Good morning, participants. Good morning, resource persons, ladies and gentlemen. You are here at ADB's largest conference, largest forum. This is the Asia Pacific Clean Energy Forum. And the theme this year is partnering for impact. You're all here to bring change, the change we need for a better future. Welcome to Manila. I'd like to welcome now our Vice President, Bambang Susitano, He's the Vice President for Knowledge Management at the ADB to provide us with some welcome remarks. Thank you, Susan. President Nakao, Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and again, a very warm welcome to our Asia Clean Energy Forum 2019 on behalf of the Asian Development Bank and our co-organizer, the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Korea Energy Agency, and our knowledge partner, the International Energy Agency, we are pleased to bring together clean energy practitioners from across the region and around the world to showcase new ideas in this ASEF 2019. There are over 1,200 people from 70 countries registered with strong representative from the private sector entrepreneurs, from project developer, bank and financial institutions, together with government representative, technical specialists, researcher, youth organization, and civil society. Last year, ADB finalized our strategy 2030, setting the direction of our work over the next 10 years. Reflecting on strategy 2030, the theme for this year ASAP is partnering for impact which bring strategy into practice. Our current strategy leapfrogs and identifies seven operational priority areas, as you can see in this slide, taking a bold step by focusing on the impact of our interventions. The energy sector plays a key role in deepening the quality impact through the delivery of innovative investments across all the seven operational priority areas. Strategy 2030 changes how ADB design projects and challenges us to deploy better solutions with the highest impacts. For example, when designing a transmission line to bring power to a city, we need to question how can this support rural development? 
and search for solutions to provide power to communities and support value chains all along the route. While supporting policy development to improve energy sector governance, we need to question how we can increase gender inclusion, for example. Further, through so our work in the energy space, we need to consider how energy sector projects can contribute to the creations of regional public goods by always searching for higher ambitions on climate goals and regional cooperations. The SF this year reflects the systemic and strategic thinking by partnering across other sectors in alignment with our strategy 2030. We have aligned our program to reflect the priorities of strategy 2030. Additionally, we have introduced a number of other innovations. First, throughout ASEF, we are sharing the story of ADB investment in several of our member countries, demonstrating the impact we are making. Second, ASEF 2019 has doubled the women speakers and attendance compared to last year through targeted efforts and also outreach. We are purchasing carbon credits to offset all the travel-related emissions from attendees at the ASEF 2019. And finally, we are greatly limiting our printed materials and using electronic media for conference materials. This is all part of ADB walking the talk of sustainable development. So I know that all of us here as stakeholders in the development community and the energy sector have aimed to maximize the tangible results of the work we do. I also believe that this renewed focus on deeper impacts will complement the work in other sectors by partnering with, among others, urban planners to support how energy is consumed and saved in cities, water specialists to manage safe and use water sustainability in energy projects, social and financial experts to support families and businesses through productive use of energy in rural setting, and waste management professional to recycle, upcycle, and reduce waste in cities, communities, and in our oceans. This year, we have a very special partnership with the youth. Youth engagement is a key component of ASAF this year to empower the next generation of energy leaders in finding innovative solutions to address the challenge we face. In partnership with ADB Youth for Asia initiative, we held a crash course yesterday on sustainable energy and entrepreneurship, followed by a voltage tank, similar to the American TV show Shark Tank, where youth team pitched their solutions to clean energy challenges from the crash course to a panel of expert judges. The winner from the Voltic Tank will present their solution in our closing ASAP plenary. These young leaders will showcase their solution in our youth launch located, located in Annex 2 all week, beginning this afternoon. And there will also be special presentations from our youth leaders starting at 3 p.m. today. So please be sure to visit the launch and pull up a bean bag to chat with these young entrepreneurs throughout the week. Ladies and gentlemen, energy has been referred by the UN Secretary General as the golden thread that connects all the sustainable development goals. We at ADB recognize this through our operational priorities. At Asia Clean Energy Forum 2019, I request you all to partner to bring power to people through partnership for delivering the desired impact in Asia and the Pacific region. Thank you all for the participation and engagement. And once again, welcome to Asia Clean Energy Forum 2019. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. We now have the great honor to hear from Amory Lovins. He's the co-founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute. He's also an author of numerous books, has advised many governments in the world, and for many, many years is predicting the future that we are currently in already and that we are embarking towards. And I think the following quote is probably describing him very well. The only limit to your impact is your imagination and your commitment. And that is definitely what Mr. Lovins has showed for several years. So we are very happy to welcome him, him here to the um, Asia Pacific Clean Energy Forum and provide us with his keynote. Thank you.
Thank you, President Takao, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the honor of <clears throat> reporting some nice surprises in the global energy transition. Let me start with a little history. Ford's auto industry, Edison's electricity industry, and Rockefeller's oil industry changed the world. If Ford and Edison took a very long nap on one of their car camping holidays together and woke up today and saw their businesses, they would recognize almost everything except the electronics. And yet their industries face vast disruptions. We have 21st century technology and speed colliding head on with 20th and even 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. Today, that collision focuses here in Asia. And now the first two of these three great industries, autos and electricity, are coming together to eat the third one, oil. As we might imagine Ford mischievously muttering to Edison, let's see what happens when electricity displaces gasoline, then those electric cars add flexibility and cheap distributed storage, and they make batteries cheap for all, helping the grid to integrate varying solar and wind power so distributed renewables replace giant power plants and their fossil fuels. The world's biggest energy source, though, is bigger than oil. It's the energy saved just since 1990, two-thirds of it by more efficient technologies. If, for example, the United States' total energy primary demand had kept growing in lockstep with GDP since 1975, Americans would have used this much energy. But instead, they cut that use by more than half. Meanwhile, renewable energy output doubled, yet with 30 times less cumulative impact than the savings. Renewables get virtually all the headlines because they're visible, but energy is invisible and the energy you don't use is almost unimaginable. Yet saved energy is avoiding about twice as much carbon each year as renewable growth, and the potential savings keep growing. Around 1975, the United States government and industry all said the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP could never drop. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in 50 years. So far, it's dropped 58% in 43 years. Yet just the innovations already added by 2010 can save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, at a third the real cost. And today that looks conservative, because optimizing buildings, vehicles, and factories as whole systems, not as piles of parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. The evidence for that surprise is in a new peer-reviewed paper. Just search for the phrase, how big is the energy efficiency resource? And please start with the four-minute video abstract. Unlike oil or copper, most of the new several-fold larger savings cost less than the old savings because they come not from adding more or fancier devices, but from using fewer and simpler devices, more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. So while metal ore bodies and oil reservoirs are finite and depletable assemblages of atoms, energy efficiency resources are infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas, depleting only stupidity, a very abundant resource. Let me give you a few examples. My wife Judy and I live here, 2,200 meters up in the Colorado Rocky Mountains near Aspen, where temperatures used to dip to minus 44 Celsius. But our house does no combustion. That's so 20th century. Super insulation, ventilation, heat recovery, and big super windows insulating like 16 to 22 sheets of glass, but looking like two, costing less than three, using 6,000-year-old Chinese passive solar architecture, make the building 99% passive solar heated, 1% active solar, and super efficiency added less construction costs than eliminating the heating system and subtracted saving 99% of space and water heating energy, 90% of household electricity, half the water, all paid back in 10 months with 1983 technology. Today's is better and cheaper. The central atrium, seen here in a February snowstorm, has so far produced 75 passive solar banana crops. Without needing to look like this, our house has helped inspire several hundred thousand European passive buildings that likewise have no heating and roughly normal construction costs. 
Integrative design that gives many benefits from each expenditure. So the white arch at the top of the upper middle photo has 12 functions, but it has only one cost. And similar methods have been successfully adapted to saving 90% of air conditioning energy in Bangkok with better comfort and no extra cost. About everybody in the world lives between that climate and my climate. And such integrative design is how our Empire State Building retrofit saved 38% of its energy with a three-year payback. But three years later, our cost-effective Denver retrofit saved 70%, making this half-century-old government complex more efficient than what was then the best new U.S. office, which in turn is less than half as efficient as our own net positive, no mechanicals, passive office in the coldest North American climate zone. Now there's a South German building using three-fifths less energy than ours. And yet all these technologies existed more than a decade ago. What mainly improved is not so much technology as design, the way we choose and combine technologies. Likewise, in Muggy, India, Rohan Parikh's team built one and a half million square meters of offices that use 80% uh, less energy than normal. They cost 10 or 20% less to build, yet that gives superior comfort and satisfaction. Glare-free lighting is delivered throughout by contract. If workers complain of glare and want lights, the architect doesn't get paid. The Global Cooling Prize, launched by Rocky Mountain Institute, Mission Innovation, and the Government of India, will at least quintuple the efficiency of affordable window air conditioners. But good design can first re displace refrigerated cooling. These mid-rise apartments proven popular in the Indian monsoon use passive, convectively vented double walls and super-efficient ceiling fans to keep you feeling 16 to 19 Celsius cooler at just 2% higher construction costs. And with a few further refinements, they could deliver decent comfort with no air conditioning. In the United States, by 2050, at historically reasonable rates, buildings which use three-fourths of electricity can become three or four times more efficient, saving $1.4 trillion net present value with a 33% internal rate of return. So those savings are worth four times their costs. An industry can accelerate too, doubling its energy productivity with a 21% internal rate of return. Contrary to a popular meme, I do not think industrial process heat or heavy transport are uniquely difficult to decarbonize, they're just differently difficult. <coughs> industry uses half the world's energy and electricity. My team's latest 40-odd billion dollars worth of industrial retrofit designs typically found 30 to 60 percent energy savings, paying back in a few years, and far outperforming the brown zone in the upper left, where most energy those companies deliver disintegrated design. Our new build projects generally found 40 to 90 plus percent savings with lower capital cost than normal. These better results come from rethinking industrial processes while redesigning basic elements like pump, fan, and motor systems. For example, better pipe and duct design, saving 80 or 90 percent of friction, could, if fully deployed, save a fifth of the world's electricity or about half the world's coal-fired electricity with extremely juicy returns. Yet this remains largely unnoticed and unpracticed because it's not a technology, it's a design method. And few people yet think of design as a scaling vector, a way to make things big fast. More on that Wednesday in our deep dive workshop on integrative design for radical energy efficiency. Now most of the energy needed to move automobiles is caused by their weight. And each unit of energy saved at the wheels saves a further four or five units. You don't need to waste getting that energy to the wheels, so it leverages five or six units of fuel saved in the tank. Very light and strong materials like carbon fiber composites can save half the weight, as in this four to six fold more efficient carbon fiber hybrid SUV, or two thirds of the weight, as in this Toyota concept plug-in hybrid. Six years ago, BMW launched mid-volume production of this carbon fiber electric car that was profitable from the first unit and was made with one-third the normal capital and water and half the normal energy, space, and time. Carbon fiber hypercars made at normal costs by our simplified methods could save far more oil than Saudi Arabia lifts. 
Our manufacturing technology now in the supply chain can make a complex two by two meter carbon fiber car part in one minute. Even aluminum fleet vans, like this one ton lightened hybrid that we developed and road tested nine years ago, could raise fuel efficiency by three to 12 fold, depending on driving cycle, and it needs no subsidy. In heavy transport, we help Walmart's truck fleet save half its fuel per case in a decade including smarter logistics, but better technology alone can profitably make U.S. heavy trucks at least three times more efficient, and airplanes three to five times more efficient, like these decade-old designs by Boeing, NASA, and MIT. The industry was therefore interested when I recently described to two global aviation conferences a way to achieve those breakthrough efficiencies in one leapfrog rather than incrementally over the next century. With super efficiency then, the oil and gas reserves unsellable for competitive reasons could get even bigger than the reserves unburnable for climate reasons, putting oil owners even more at risk for market competition than from climate regulation. The cost of getting U.S. autos completely off oil has fallen from $18 per safe barrel seven years ago to less than $10 today, heading below zero in the next six years. So oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. Electricity too, quadrupling US electric end use efficiency costs about a tenth as much as the retail electricity it saves. So super efficiency will make the transition to renewable, resilient, distributed digital electricity much easier and faster most of all for the nearly one billion people with little or no electricity. In this 27 watt electric household, Berkeley Lab uses solar panels one third smaller than those shown here to power 7,000 looks of LED lights, a mobile phone charger, a clock radio, a table fan, and a 56 centimeter color television. Their high efficiencies cut the total capital cost in half, empowering twice as many off-grid families for the same money and enabling cheap and highly reliable DC solar microgrids. And if you invest at the macro scale to make things that save electricity rather than supplying more, you'll need roughly a thousand times less capital and you'll recover it 10 times faster. Multiply intensity times velocity and you need about 10,000 times less capital for the most capital intensive sector, electricity, which devours about one fourth of the world's development capital. Freeing up that capital to fund other development needs is the biggest macroeconomic lever we know for development. Just buy megawatts whenever they're cheaper than megawatts and reward providers for reducing bills, not for selling more energy. With electricity as with fuels, both technology and design are moving efficiency into fast forward. Prior lighting improvements are being swept away as LEDs each decade get 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, 10 times cheaper. What else changes this fast? The rest of the energy transformation, modern renewables. LEDs turn electricity into light. Backwards, they become PVs, photovoltaics, turning light into electricity. Uh, uh, and their prices, meteorite strike, has brought solar and in aqua wind power costs below the dashed lines, the cost of fossil fuels fed into US power stations, often making old coal and gas and nuclear plants uneconomic just to run. The same is happening quickly across East Asia. Over the next three years, it will turn new coal plants into pre-stranded assets, often before they can even be built. But the electricity transformation is much bigger than that competition. You see, it's generally wise to sell customers what they want before someone else does. Customers are figuring out that they can buy fewer electrons, use them more productively and timely, produce their own, and even trade them with each other. Indeed, powerful disruptors are converging on the electricity industry from at least eight directions. These eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse don't just add, they exponentiate. They're not lone wolves, they hunt in packs, they multiply quickly, and they can gobble half of utility revenues in the 2020s. Together, they're quickly creating an alien competitive landscape 
even as more Pac-Men are coming over the hill. And when renewables get cheaper, we buy more. So they get cheaper, so we buy more. In the past two years, modern renewables, which don't include big hydro dams, have supplied about two-thirds of the world's total net additions of generating capacity, thanks to their powerful business case. U.S. wholesale electricity prices now widely exceed the average long-term fixed prices of wind and of solar power. Their temporary subsidies are less than the permanent subsidies to non-renewables, yet in unsubsidized global markets, renewables at or below $30 a megawatt hour, the diamonds, keep falling through 20 towards 10. The cheapest solar power is in India, and it's made now at least two-thirds of the coal-fired power plants uneconomic to run. Six quarters ago, Mexico's unsubsidized low bids were $19 for photovoltaics, 17 for wind power. Developing nations already dominate these global investments, and by next year, renewables will beat fossil fuels in every major region on Earth. As median Colorado bids did six quarters ago, even including storage, the filled squares. PV and wind power output do vary, but at least as predictably as demand. Reliably integrating them into the grid is no harder, and it's probably cheaper than backing up intermittent thermal power stations. Consider the difficult case of Texas, whose grid has no big hydro dams and is not connected to the rest of the United States. A 2050 summer week's expected loads can get much smaller and less peaky with profitably efficient use. Then we can make 86% of the annual electricity with wind and photovoltaics and 14% from dispatchable renewables. This 100% renewable supply can then match the load by putting surplus electricity into two kinds of distributed storage that are worth buying anyway, ice storage air conditioning and smart charging of electric autos, then recovering that energy when needed and filling the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. That yields 100% renewable energy every hour of the year with no bulk storage and with only 5% left over. So the economics should be excellent even at today's prices, let alone lower future prices. Some grid operators do such choreography today. Germany, Italy, and Britain are about one-third renewably powered. But four other European countries with modest or no hydropower meet about half to three-fourths of their electricity needs today from renewables, adding no bulk storage and with superior reliability. For Denmark and Germany, 10 times U.S. reliability. The ultra-reliable former East German utility is 42% wind and solar powered. And its CEO says that could rise to 60 or 70% without adding bulk storage. So as my colleague Clay Stranger says, the operators have learned to run these grids the way a, a conductor leads the symphony orchestra. No instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously makes beautiful music. Grid integration gets even easier with smart bi-directional hookups of parked battery electric cars. Last year, China sold more electric vehicles than the world sold the year before. Next year, the world will have over 200 electric models. That's because of, and it causes, plummeting battery prices. Now, India, Germany, major automakers have such ambitious electric vehicle targets that if the grid did need cheap batteries, they'd arrive a decade or two sooner than expected. In fact, automotive, automotive battery packs in 2018 cost less than recent predictions for 10 years from now. And most forecasts of electric vehicle growth may well be conservative. By about 2024, electric vehicles will cost no more to buy than today's gasoline autos. Abundant cheap batteries imply distributed solar everywhere, gas industry distress, the end of thermal power plants, vast distributed storage and demand flexibility, and perhaps much of the grids becoming a stranded assets like phone company copper. This prospect gives utility executives nightmares and it gives venture capitalists sweet dreams. 
Meanwhile, efficient and electric autos are morphing from pigs, personal internal combustion gasoline still dominated vehicles, to SEALs, shareable electric autonomous lightweight service vehicles. Those two changes in technology and three changes in business model are all simultaneous, mutually reinforcing, vigorously in play, and radically sped by India and China. They are speeding this global mobility revolution even as the US nears peak personal car ownership in the next five years. So there's a perfect storm brewing for the oil, steel, car, and electricity industries, among others. Now, assembling all these opportunities, our 2011 US business book, Reinventing Fire, rigorously showed how to triple efficiency and quintuple renewables by 2050, needing no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, at least a third less natural gas, while saving $5 trillion, growing the economy 2.6-fold, strengthening national security, and cutting fossil carbon emissions 82 to 86 percent, yet needing no new inventions and no acts of Congress, but with smart city and state policies led by business for profit. And the first eight years of this 40-year journey are nicely on track, green actual versus blue proposed, because I think the private sector smells the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. These best buys are also the most effective solutions to big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. And if you like any of these outcomes of reinventing fire, you could support the transition without having to like every outcome and without needing to agree about which outcome is most important. Focusing on outcomes, not motives, can turn gridlock and conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge. Stimulated by those US findings at the G20 three years ago, the Energy Research uh, Institute of China's National Development and Reform Commission published its roadmap for China's energy revolution, aided by Berkeley Lab, Energy Foundation China, and Rocky Mountain Institute. It details how China can save over $3 trillion, use energy seven times more productively, shift supply two-thirds off fossil fuels, emit 42% less carbon, burn 80% less coal with a seven-fold bigger economy, and get 13 times more GDP from each ton of fossil carbon. This roadmap strongly informed China's 13th five-year plan, whose energy authors were our steering committee. Extrapolating these on-track US adopted Chinese and similar European findings to the other half of the world could achieve the Paris Agreement's two-degree climate target about $18 trillion cheaper in net present value, assuming that carbon and all other externalities are valued at zero, a conservatively low estimate. Reinvesting some of that $18 trillion saving in natural systems carbon removal could then reach one and a half degrees with trillions of dollars left over and huge progress on the sustainable development goals. Making climate protection not costly but profitable should also simplify the politics. Under these competitive forces, Markets can flip with breathtaking speed, as Tony Seba's archival photos show. On Fifth Avenue in New York, in 1900, you have to look hard for the first car. Does anyone see it? There it is. Just 13 years later, you have to look harder for the last horse. The non-farm horse market had peaked in 1910 when there were only 3% as many cars as horses. The horse and buggy industry thought it would have many decades to adapt, but Ford's Model T got 62% cheaper in 13 years. Car owning households soared from 8% to about 60% in 10 years. Three fourths financed by a General Motors and DuPont innovation called car loans. Today our solar modules just got 80% cheaper in five years. Three fourths of rooftop solar is innovatively financed and Ford's and Edison's industries are merging to eat Rockefeller's industry. Thus, the pace of transformation is set 
not by incumbents, but by insurgents who were not inhibited by incumbents' business models or legacy assets or cultures. Moreover, investors flee even before customers do because capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. Once they think you're in or even headed for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before they decapitalize you and reinvest in your successors. Already, $8 trillion have prudently fled the world's fossil fuel industries. Even the CEO of Saudi Aramco recently bemoaned perceptions of long-term oil decline that he said are making it hard to get capital and talent. One last thought. The energy transformation I've summarized is not just fundamental, it's elemental. The first industrial revolution was the age of carbon, creating our prosperity and the world's mightiest industries from coal and oil and gas. But now, that obsolete age of carbon is giving way to the modern age of silicon. Silicon microchips, telecoms, and software turn people from isolated to networked, systems from dumb to smart, grids from analog to digital, and potentially from dirigiste to democratized. Silicon power electronics make electricity interconvertible and precisely applicable, replacing fiery molecules with obedient electrons. And silicon solar cells enable the ascent of energy from mining the fires of hell to harvesting the breath and radiance of heaven. So our opportunity together is to help enable the new energy system, not protect the old one. So the global energy transformation can move at the pace and the cost of design and software, not of infrastructure, and can be not constrained by the inertia of incumbents, but sped by the ambition of insurgents. Thank you all for your good work and your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Lovins. This was a very optimistic outlook, and it shows that uh, the time is ripe, we have the technology, and all it requires now is the right mindset. Um, the economic model is already there, so we don't have to wait for that anymore. To dive now deeper into this discussion of what is uh, possible with the technology that we have and how we can harness this, I would like to invite our esteemed panel. We have with us already. Amory Lovins, and uh, I'd like to invite, please, uh, Fiza Fahan. She uh, is an entrepreneur and has worked in the energy field in Pakistan. She's also now an advisor and member of the UN High-Level Panel on Women and Economic Empowerment. Um, please, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. And of course, we would like to invite um, ADB's president, Mr. Nakao. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And this panel will be not moderated by Timur Nabili, uh, who is um, for many years a TV host, moderator, and journalist, has worked for numerous uh, TV channels, BBC, Al Jazeera, Channel News Asia. Um, so, please welcome this panel, and we do hope to have a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Suzanne, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Nice to see such a nice full room uh, to attend such a very important series of conversations that we're going to be having over the next couple of days. And I'm very, very happy to be able to kick the whole series off uh, with this interesting conversation. Coming off the back of uh, Amory's fascinating presentation, uh, which was rich in detail uh, and very inspiring in its promise, but we're going to explore a little bit about that promise and talk a little bit about how uh, our clean energy future uh, might come about and, and what are the challenges and the opportunities that it presents. We're going to talk for about half an hour, ladies and gentlemen, and then we're going to hopefully come to you. There are microphones. Uh, on the floor, so if you want to engage in the conversation, please do, don't hesitate, just stand up and talk to one of those microphones and the panel will be happy to take your questions. 
So let's begin by just setting the groundwork. I mean, the, the, the basis of our conversation here is envisioning the low energy future. Uh, we want to talk about harnessing technology for impact in the coming years and look forward and, and try and present an optimistic and plausible path towards that low energy future. So we've heard Emery's thoughts and you've spoken at length, uh, Emery, about how the technology exists, about how the configuration of that technology is perfectly applicable today. What we need to discuss is why it has not yet been applied and what the future might actually bring in terms of making that happen, both from a technology perspective, both from a multilateral development bank perspective. And we'll talk about how uh, we can put together the institutions that will make that happen. But let me begin, Fiza, with you, if I could, because one thing that we haven't talked about much is what happens on the ground. We talk about uh, what a low carbon future might look like in technology terms. But tell us about your experiences in Pakistan and what it means in practical terms for people, for human beings, and particularly in your specialist area of, of gender impact. So thank you so much. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure being here. Good morning, everybody. Um, as, as you've correctly mentioned, Taimur, that from the human perspective, the solutions for the energy uh, problems and the energy crisis of the world are very simple. Uh, while Emery mentioned the uh, technological innovations and what all is happening in the future and where technology is going, and uh, I'm sure President Nakao will talk about the trillions of dollars going into the energy space. When I see it from the lens of an entrepreneur in Pakistan, from somebody who's actually looking to do, create tangible solutions to the problems a country like Pakistan faces, where we still have 47% of the population still living in the dark, where we still face eight to 10 hours of load shedding in cities like Lahore, where I come from, where I live, right? Um, the solutions are very simple. The country is facing a deficit of 6,000 megawatts of energy right now, and the solar potential alone for Pakistan is 100,000 megawatts. So we all, know, we all know the beauty of solar. We all know how solar is implemented. We all know the pricing of solar has reduced substantially, so it's not just uh, an environmentally good solution or a socially sound solution, it's also commercially viable. So I just, I, I just feel on ground, there are lots of things that we all need to do in our individual spaces, as individuals and organizations, uh, within, within the space that we have around, within the technology that is already proven, within the best practices that we already have, there is ample room to actually just go out there and get things done. And that's like somebody like me who is not an engineer, who's not an energy expert, who happened to evolve into an energy expert with the industry, just went out there and started doing things from setting up small solar villages to setting up uh, gender woman-led solar energy shops and having my light ladies go out to town selling solar candles. What are your light ladies? My light ladies are the woman energy entrepreneurs that I create in the rural villages who set up social enterprises that sell energy as a business. So the woman is empowered economically while the business that she runs is that of solar energy, giving light to every household mm. in the village and, giving, and making social and economic case. So it's very simple, you know, uh, going out to dairy companies, giving them solar milk chillers. Um, I find that the solutions, the problems are very complex and very multidimensional, but the solutions are very simple when you look at it from the point of view of an entrepreneur. The solutions are very simple in an individual and small context, small community context. The solutions at scale, are they somewhat different? Well, um, okay, so, so my experience, and I'll talk more about that, and I don't want to take all the thunder from my spotlight speech after the coffee break. Uh, I'll talk more about it then, but even at the commercial level or at the macro level, the solutions still remain simple. However, there you need the partnerships to come to play. The, the main theme of ACF this year, Partnering for Impact, you need different stakeholders to take their part. You need the governments to come in with the regulatory regimes. Uh, you need the right kind of technology to achieve that scale. But we've worked across the tier, so not just the rural villages, but we worked in the private sector, in the, in the corporations, in the dairy milk chillers, as well as the governments. The solutions are, 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 you rightly said, as you scale through that trajectory, the solutions become complicated, but that's where the partnerships come to play, and that's where multiple stakeholders come to, come to set their tone in uh, giving solutions for the energy crisis. I'm glad you brought up the partnering issue, because that clearly is going to be part of the whole solution. Amory, you spoke in, in your presentation a moment ago about how 
we're still relying on institutions and processes and practices from the 20th century to implement what we're talking about in the 21st century. You also talked about um, how silicon helps us network. And yet that partnership process is not necessarily still as seamless and effective as it might be. How can we get to scale through partnership to implement the kind of things you've been talking about? The technologies I was talking about, like solar, are scalable up and down in a continuous spectrum. Uh, for example, you just talked about uh, the, the village scale. How about the individual scale? How about a Pico grid? And it's smart chips that enable this thing to work. This is a Dutch device with no connectors or wires to break. Solar panels on the front, LED lights on the back. This sits on a, on a Coke bottle so your the light shines on the table and your daughter can learn to read. And with one day's charge, it will shine very brightly. So it's called Waka Waka, which means shine brightly in Swahili. For 10 hours at that intensity, turn it down, it'll run 150 hours like that on a day's charge in the sun, two days in the cloud. Now, you can finance it uh, from scratch cards or from your uh, mobile phone, mobile banking, and you, you charge that off the USB port. And this pays back in weeks to months against kerosene lamps. Now think about the development story here. Uh, the world's uh, nearly billion poorest people uh, are spending $38 billion a year on kerosene. It's killing millions of people a year. It would rank eighth among nations in carbon emissions. And they're paying a sixth of the total global cost of lighting services, but they're getting only a thousandth of the world's light uh, because the uh, kerosene lamps are so inefficient. Now, paying back in weeks to months against that, this device is like, for the $2 a day family, it's like a perpetual annuity giving them an extra month's income a year. And think what difference that makes. So I, I, I do want to, to and, ask and it's about... it's because of the sophistication and the efficiency of the device. It's so small you can tuck it in your sari when you go to the field, nobody will steal it and so on. It's a, it's a fantastic solution for a particular issue and, and at a particular level. But I do want to talk about the, the bigger picture, the scale picture. I mean, we're, we're talking here about partnering to make solutions applicable and available for vast numbers of people. And also to talk about how we can persuade industry and the big global institutions to start taking part in the uh, distribution and the perpetuation of this kind of solution. How do we make the, how do we address those issues? At, at the big scale, we have now multi-gigawatt solar, wind, and in some cases storage uh, projects that are just like conventional power plants, except they build faster and have less risk and cost less. And, and that's the kind of thing that a large institution can easily handle. At, at an intermediate scale, uh, I have a, a team at, at our institute that has taken photovoltaic costs for, for the whole system from roughly eight to four to two cents a kilowatt hour, two or two and a half. And that's at a village scale or a town scale, half to five megawatts. Uh, and that's the kind of thing, again, would be perfectly suited to indigenous entrepreneurs. And it's already on the Australian market, ordered in the US and so on. Uh, and that means you can pretty well fill in the whole spectrum of scale, but that one connects directly to distribution. It needn't wait on transmission lines. Uh, so that simplifies institutionally uh, all of the infrastructure building that we're accustomed to for the very big units. President Cow, from your perspective, what are the challenges in, in these areas that we're talking about? And what are the, what are the role that institutions should be playing? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome all these uh, participants from uh, all over uh, Asia and also beyond. And uh, especially this year, we have uh, 1,300 uh, uh, participants. And uh, this is the uh, 14th uh, uh, forum of this kind uh, uh, since 2006. And uh, uh, we are very happy to have uh, such a facility to accommodate uh, all these participants. and. Uh, uh, it is supported by USAID and uh, uh, Korean Energy Agency and the international energy agencies and uh, the f funding from these institutions uh, supporting uh, some visitors from uh, the developing uh, countries of Asia. And uh, uh, we include uh, academicians and uh, youth, <coughs> youth uh, civil service organizations and uh, civil society organizations and also 
the uh, private sector. So this is such an important gathering to learn each other. Uh, ADB was uh, founded in uh, 1966, and at that moment, the most immediate uh, challenge was how to feed people, because uh, the, there was a growing population and uh, the food uh, uh, supply was uh, in shortage. But uh, over years, the food problem is mitigating, although we need to still pay attention to rural development and also safe, uh, nutritious, delicious uh, uh, agriculture product. But Energy has been always very important because it supports industry, it supports uh, 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 the household, uh, uh, including uh, the more convenient life for uh, women uh, and also uh, for, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, for education and health and other uh, things. Uh, the stable energy supply is so important. So in, uh, at, in Asian developing countries, uh, population is about 3.8 billion and about the 250 uh, population is now, a uh, million population is uh, under the absolute poverty of $1.9 a day. But we are still lacking the energy access for 350 uh, peop uh, million people. So energy is so important uh, challenge still, and uh, as uh, uh, already mentioned, uh, in many countries, blackout is still a very important issue. So for industries and for families, for society, communities, uh, energy is still a challenge. And how to do it is uh, important, as uh, we have been discussing. Just to give access of energy is not enough. Uh, we should also care the uh, environmental issues, and especially climate issues. So how we can develop, how can we can grow in Asia, and how we can develop energy access, how clean we can be is a challenge. And uh, the ADB is a part of our, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this challenge. And th those challenges that you articulate, obviously, when you talk about the ADB's history, mm -hmm. the approaches towards solving those problems in the 20th century were predicated on a system that brought in large institutional scale-based energy production. Uh, and the kind of thing that uh, Amory has been telling us about is, is a whole new paradigm for making and solving the problems that we have. And do, do, you, th do you think that the, the, the kind of wholesale mind shift mm. that Amory talks about is possible in the developing markets of today? I think uh, it is possible because uh, in a sense we are now increasing uh, energy uh, uh, supply capacities in developing countries and uh, there is a chance of uh, leapfrogging because we came uh, later. So uh, in case of ADB we are supporting uh, renewable and energy efficiency. We don't uh, support uh, coal anymore. Uh, uh, in very ex uh, exceptional case, we may uh, support uh, very clean energy, supercritical, but we haven't done that since, uh, I mean, for these several years after the final project in Pakistan, uh, Jamshoro, or the coal energy over supercritical. But since I became president, that was only one. And we are now moving to the renewable and also energy efficiency. Renewable means uh, solar, geothermal and wind, and also transmission to support uh, the uh, uh, supply of these energies. So we are trying to go ahead of uh, the uh, change uh, of uh, developed, developed countries. Please, uh, what, talking about the whole mind shift problem, how does that work uh, in, a, in a country like Pakistan? Uh, Amory is going to Pakistan next week to talk to, to the new president about the issues that he's talking about. But what sort of reception will he get from the institutional uh, culture in Pakistan? And how easy will it be for him to persuade Imran Khan that a new approach is necessary? So uh, the, the work's much easier for you, Amory, now, because um, the new prime minister, Imran Khan, um, he genuinely believes in uh, climate change as a very as as a as a core um, uh, as a platform on which the growth of the economy must be based on. Um, as far as the mindset change that you talked about, Demur, I believe that the mindsets have now changed because of a necessity. When I started operating in the energy space in the country about a, a decade and a half ago. Nobody was willing to invest in solar. Nobody was willing to talk about solar. The energy crisis was just coming up. People thought it's temporary. People thought it's okay, you know, there's some problems, the dam dried up, it's summers, it's okay, we'll get it back. Over the years, energy crisis has become a reality. It has become not just a reality, it has become one of the largest, the biggest nightmare that every household goes through every day. 
we actually, in our, in our daily lives, we make our schedule across around when we'll have light, when we won't have light. You know, that's how it works. Uh, industries have experienced tremendous losses. Small industries have shut down. For every 10% drop in the energy supply, 50% loss of productivity goes to the industry. So it has now become a nightmare, which has inevitably led to a change of mindset. People have realized that there is no solution. This is here to stay. The energy crisis is not going anywhere. This is not just a talk. It's, it's something, it's a reality. And the state has unfortunately failed uh, in providing solutions for the, for, the, for the 220 million people that live in the country. So people, the mindset shift has been to take things in your own hand, to go towards captive power, to set up your own sustainable solar plants. People are setting up solar on the residentials, on, on, the, on the residential community in their companies. Solar is now becoming a, a, a reality because that has become the only solution people of Pakistan have. So the mindset has changed. People have realized they need to take the energy crisis in their own hands and work towards a solution. So hence, now I think is the time for breakthroughs to happen in technology, in financing, in actually hitting the problem at the root. So I believe, Amory, you will have a very, very productive trip next week. And I'll uh, be happy to facilitate that. I, I, hope, I hope you're right in saying that the mindset has changed. I mean, it maybe has. in Pakistan it has, but what we need now is to see that mindset change being actually realized in practical... into practical projects and work. And there was a phrase that you used, uh, Amory, at one point, where you said, our future is composed of fewer and simpler devices, more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced, which I thought was a really interesting phrase. Uh, and for the engineers in the room, which I'm sure there are many, that whole process of putting things together in the right way at the right time in the right sequence is, is, a, is an interesting and, and, uh, and exciting challenge. However, it's also a very small, detailed process that requires, again, back to partnership. It requires lots of different actors to align in practical ways. And I'm wondering, is that the reason why we don't see more application uh, of these kind of technologies in broad scale? because it's difficult to, to put all those pieces in place? Yeah, so let me give a practical example. A big glass office tower uh, that we looked at in the early 90s was 20 years old, so the seals around the windows were starting to fail. It's normal, and every 20 years you have to reskin the curtain wall, redo the, the glass facade. Uh, and normally you would replace it with the sort of glass that was already there, which was dark, heat-absorbing glass, uh, and hardly any light came in. It was very unpleasant. Uh, but if instead you replaced it with super windows that were almost perfect in letting in light w without heat and would insulate four times better, uh, and you did better deep daylight, lighting controls, office equipment, you could cut the cooling load on the hottest day by three-fourths which meant you could make the whole cooling system three quarters uh, smaller, and you would save more money doing that than you would pay extra to make it four times more efficient. So altogether, by coordinating all these uh, deep retrofit tasks with this big building event that happens anyway every 20 years, uh, you could save three fourths of the energy with a minus five month payback. In other words, slightly cheaper than the regular renovation you have to do anyway that saves nothing. So we designed software so that owners of real estate portfolios can figure out in which year they're going to be renewing the facade, renewing the mechanicals, other major building events, so as to coordinate with those for right-timed deep retrofit. Because it's going to take us decades to fix up all these big buildings, so we might as well do them at the right time. And that does magic uh, for how much you save and how little it costs. So this is, I think, for owners of a lot of real estate, not an uh, unusual level of sophistication. They're very sophisticated in financial and planning matters. And <clears throat> I think all the great cities of the world with these big buildings have a similar opportunity. President Kavi, the, the ADB's role in lending in the developing countries has always been at scale. Uh, has always been predicated on the idea that the bigger the deal, the more impact it has. In the context of, again, these smaller technologies aligning in, in the appropriate ways, how do you think the ADB's processes might evolve? 
So as you said, uh, scale is important. So we have increased our lending and grant operations uh, by about 50% from uh, $14 billion a year in 2013 to 2018, uh, it was uh, $22 billion. So I think uh, still scale is important, but uh, we are now looking at quality uh, in uh, addition to the volume, and the quality means uh, life uh, cycle cost and uh, better technologies for the mitigations and adaptations and uh, clean, cleaner energies. And also, we should pay more attention to smaller projects, uh, even if it is small. So in terms of uh, volume, we cannot uh, uh, gain a lot, but uh, we can support uh, small uh, off-grid project in Pacific Island countries. Those are not uh, uh, very significant in numbers of uh, volume or lending, but it is still uh, has a very uh, uh, the, uh, demonstration or impact or uh, uh, the development in, in impact that it can be also uh, the, uh, 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 used for other projects in countries, a smaller project in some countries in Pacific and in Central Asia and so on. So we must pay more attention to uh, these uh, uh, the, uh, uh, elements, which are not uh, beyond uh, the volume. But uh, I would like to mention three things uh, in our priorities. One is, of course, in addition to volume, but one is about uh, how to use the private sector, the uh, impetus or motivations. Uh, we need the private sectors for financing our projects in uh, Asia. Uh, uh, we need to mobilize more private sector resources. Uh, in the end, the private sector is an engine for the innovations and also engine for financing. Uh, uh, for instance, in Japan, many people believe Japan is more, uh, I mean, led by the government, but uh, power companies have been always private uh, sectors, uh, eight or nine power companies. Uh, the, Tokyo Electricity started uh, uh, as a Tokyo lamp company uh, for servicing uh, some household. Because uh, at that moment, it was only lamp which used uh, electricity. But anyway, uh, private sector is important for financing and uh, innovations of uh, things. And uh, then we need uh, to integrate the more uh, developed technologies in our operations. We should always try to include, incorporate uh, more advanced technologies, clean down technology in our project, whether it is energy or transport or urban. Because uh, our lending is still limited compared to the very big uh, volume uh, needed for the financing uh, the uh, infrastructure development in Asia. So what we can do is to incorporate better technologies, better ideas, better governance. So then it comes to the, my third point. That is, we need uh, always uh, better institutions, better governance for doing things, whether it is energy or not. And uh, although uh, private sector should uh, play a very important role, we still need a very strong governance, or strong government, in other words, including uh, municipalities and others. And we need also need the global communities urge to do something like uh, the COP21 or COP uh, systems for climate change. And uh, uh, many, many people believe that may maybe Asia is still paying attention only to growth. But when I visited countries, I found that all leaders in Asia, including in China, uh, uh, Prime Minister Hasina of Bangladesh and the Prime Minister Modi of uh, India, uh, President Widodo of uh, Indonesia, and also President Duterte of the Philippines, they all pay attention to climate change because it is also related to the environment. And they want to be a very important players of this global challenge. So they are growing. Uh, the Asia is, uh, uh, on average, uh, growing at the pace of 6% a year. And I don't think a st secular stagnation's idea that is not up, uh, uh, doesn't apply to Asia, because it is still growing at the pace of 6% after the global financial crisis. And in 12 years, it will double. So they are paying attention to growth. But uh, when I visited these countries, leaders also pay attention, great attention to environment and climate change, and also the agenda development and also science and technology education. They are trying to use the private sectors to do this. So I have a, very, a strong feeling that these leaders in Asian countries have a very strong common ideas about uh, development, including climate change. It's an important point because the common argument, particularly amongst the private sector people, is exactly that, is that actually this commitment to climate change is only on a surface level, and the GDP number is far more important at a level of governance. So you're suggesting that this is no longer the case amongst the... 
That's an interesting point. Uh, Emery, you talked about how the private sector can actually go ahead and make all of the changes, or at least the vast majority of the changes that you're talking about, without even any necessary input from, from the governance sector. So tell me how you see that. I say to the U.S. case that uh, no new federal laws are essential, but that uh, smart subnational policies are essential. For example, uh, rewarding utilities for cutting your bill, not for selling you more energy. Uh, fee baits for cars, a very powerful way, uh, and also for other vehicles, of, of arbitraging the spread and discount rate between private and social, uh, so that uh, the private buyer can take a long view of the benefits and not just the first year or two. Uh, there are many innovative policies that could be added. And of course, there are all the normal policies like building codes uh, that are absolutely essential to getting things right, and appliance efficiency standards and so on, information programs, uh, fixing split incentives between landlords and tenants or builders and buyers. There are 60 or 80 market failures in buying efficiency, each of which can be morphed into a business opportunity but this barrier busting takes relentless patience, meticulous attention to detail, and it does need policy. And it's, and just, it's just quickly, how much it's, policy it's, in change is required in Asian developing countries? Yes, yeah, very, very similar uh, slate, actually. Uh, details differ, but the similarities are more important. But I think the, the, the government should steer, not row, and that the, the, the heavy rowing gets done by the private sector because that alone has the capability to build and scale and sell stuff. And, uh, and uh, the two in, in, in concert are uh, unstoppable, but often we find one or both lagging, uh, waiting for somebody else to do something. OK. Uh, I want to invite the audience now to, to get up and, and, and ask some questions. Please do make, it, make yourself uh, available at the microphones and, and join in the conversation, folks. And while you're gathering your thoughts, let me just put this idea of institutional uh, organizational um, and governance yeah. changes to you, Fisa, because in, in, a, in a context like Afghanistan, if we have Amory's little light uh, and we have microgrid solutions and we have local empowerment, what does that tell us about the evolving role of governance, about large institutions and community level organization? Is it, does that yeah. mean your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll just, I, I love what you said in terms of the government steering and not rowing and the private, letting the private sector row because that's exactly what, what, what is required in countries like Pakistan as well. Um, initially, the government took the, the rowing in its own hands and that did not quite work out well. Lots of villages were electrified, but then a month, a few months after when you would go to the villages, children would be playing cricket with the solar panels because they were of extremely poor quality. Um, that kind of demeans the entire philosophy of renewable energy and not just the product itself because it's a very faith-based, and, and those of you sitting here who work in the communities for access to energy understand that it's a faith-based uh, concept. So you need to let the government to steer the whole direction uh, come up with incentives, with subsidies, net metering, zero tax duties, et cetera, which, which they're good at doing, and let the private sector drive the, the force and roll the entire industry with high quality product because it is, again, faith-based, and you need to make sure that what you're selling is, is going to sustain itself because that's where the energy and the promise sustains. Um, and, and obviously, it has to make commercial sense because that's the only way to make it sustainable, which it kind of does now in the economics we're living in. Interesting. Okay, folks, come ahead. Question over there. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Li Xia from uh, Shenzhen China Power Solution. So my question is for Mr. Omora and Ms. Fiza. Uh, I also have one light. It's called Candle Scaler. So it's uh, less cost, retail price, less than $3. That means uh, three months candles spend, they can buy this one light. But our challenge is very few people, especially the BOP in the last mail, can reach out to this product because nobody to build up the channels. Our importers are not so much encouraged to buy because the profit margin is so low, especially for the BOP, bottom of pyramid people. We also want to empower the women. I'm also a woman entrepreneur, uh, the founder of this Chinese uh, manufacturers. So I try to set up the manufacturer from the origin to control the cost and also the design from the e-waste. But it seems our last 10 years contribution is only covered 4.2 million families. 
So this is our challenge. We, we also want to look forward if we have any way. Uh, I also agree some utilities or government should be involved in promoting such good quality and good price products uh, to so, benefit more BOPs. So your, your question is, should governments be more involved in promoting this kind of BOP solution to the rural audience? Is yeah, it? so I also want to hear about the Mm, like uh, foundations or organi uh, the or international organizations, how to be involved in to promote the smaller products like this? Mm, def uh, to answer your question, definitely uh, the governments should be involved in promoting um, such technology which directly impact the communities. But a very good on ground innovative solution is to get the local communities involved and to make the manufacturing and the production of the product sustainable as well. One, it leads to direct economic livelihoods and creation of jobs. Uh, Barefoot College in India is doing this extremely well by training the local communities to create the products themselves, to actually build the products. So you do not rely on importing the products. Uh, the local communities gain economic livelihoods and job opportunities by making the product themselves. And it leads to sustainability because you can also technically take care of the product yourself within the community. So it becomes a very internal sustainable solution which has become a success in many countries. Quick thought, Emery? I'm also thinking in India of, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the program, the one that trains illiterate grandmothers to train village women as solar technicians. Solar grandmas? So, solar grandmas? Solar grandmas. Solar yeah. grandmas. There, there's this immense talent pool like a light uh, that they're harnessing very effectively. And you might think, oh, this takes somebody who's been to technical university and is highly trained, but it actually doesn't. Uh, we have quite a number of people now standing up and, and very limited time, folks. So please keep your questions extremely short. Uh, and uh, to, the, to the panel as well, keep your answers short. There's a lady at the back there that I'd like to call on. Hi there, thank you very much. My name's uh, Sonia Dunlop. I'm a senior policy advisor at a global climate change think tank called E3G. I have a question for President Nakao, who said just now, obviously, that um, he, the ADB is no longer supporting coal, which is unbelievably welcome, so thank you very much. Congratulations. And I'm just wondering, in the context of the ADB's energy policy review that is going to be happening next year, would you consider the next step to be something like perhaps setting a target date for 100% of the ADB's energy lending to be to zero carbon technologies and solutions? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, uh, the, we are now uh, starting reviewing uh, our energy policy, and uh, it was uh, uh, 2009 which, uh, when we had uh, the previous one, and uh, there have been a lot of uh, the new uh, development, including uh, SDGs by the uh, UN system, and also COP21 and uh, Paris Agreement, and also uh, the very new, uh, uh, more, more speedy development of technologies. So, and also the bigger Asia. Uh, uh, Asia is one, uh, today uh, one third of uh, our global GDP, but uh, in 2050 it will be uh, more than half of uh, global GDP. And so, population is a half, so it's not so surprising, but uh, there are many changes, so we should uh, uh, adjust our uh, policies to the new reality. And it's too early to tell what is the essence of uh, the policy, but of course uh, the role of uh, uh, coal will be, uh, lending to coal will be uh, one of the very important issues. I don't know whether we'll totally uh, uh, dismiss the possibility of a coal project, because in some countries uh, uh, there is uh, less uh, access to other options. But uh, anyway, we'll uh, consider these issues very carefully. Do you, do you see a future in which you might prioritize lending to renewable sources? Of course, we already do it. And okay. uh, as I said, uh, uh, the only one project uh, since I became uh, the earlier days, uh, 2014 or mm -hmm. 2013, I forgot. But the uh, Jamashor project in Pakistan was the fine, uh, last uh, coal project we supported. So it's already starting, but I don't know whether we should totally deny the idea of a possibility of uh, supporting uh, super critical coal or not, but uh, maybe we'll go, go, go in that direction. Lady over here. Excuse me. A oh, very good morning. So, sorry, we, this lady over here, thanks. Hi, good I'll, morning. I'll come to you in just a moment. Hi, my name is Hannah Fernandez. I'm from Eco Business. Uh, we are a media company that's focused on sustainable development. I have a question for uh, President Nakao as well. Um, you mentioned earlier that Asian leaders um, are still fo are, seem to be focusing just on people think the people think that um, Asian leaders are just focusing on growth, but actually 
um, there already is um, some direction towards um, climate change and environment. Um, you mentioned um, China, Bangla Bangladesh, even the Philippines is one of those uh, countries that are going that direction. Um, but currently, um, as we know, um, the Asian region still is the most coal dependent region in the world. So what indicators um, can you give us that we are indeed going towards that direction? Thanks. So uh, once again, uh, when I, I meet leaders, I'm so impressed by their very clear mind about uh, the uh, cleaner development. And of course, growth is still important because there is uh, still prevalent uh, poverty and $1.9 per day uh, income is very, uh, I mean, minimum uh, poverty. So uh, uh, the, the uh, poverty in that level is uh, now about 250 million. But if we include, uh, uh, we make it $3.9 a day, it will become like uh, uh, about uh, 2 billion populations are still under the poverty. So growth is important. In many countries, growth uh, uh, reduced the poverty and uh, uh, livelihood of the people becomes uh, elevated. So growth is important, but those countries, leaders are now paying attention to climate change environment because this is social issues also. Environment is so important for Chinese uh, 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 development and the social uh, stability is related to that issues. And climate change, they want to be a part of uh, the uh, global uh, challenge, global efforts to address these issues. So uh, you said that still we are, uh, many Asian countries are dependent on the coal, but it's also the case in uh, Germany, for instance, about 30% of energy production is still uh, in, uh, based on coal. But uh, about uh, new uh, uh, new investment, uh, the Asian countries are now moving toward uh, renewable, whether it is energy, uh, I mean solar or uh, geothermal or uh, the uh, wind. So we are moving toward that direction, but how speedy we can do. We should uh, promote uh, the, uh, the renewable investment by the ADB and by the government uh, policies and so on. But uh, 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 so, in that regard, we are moving toward that direction. Amory, quick word on that? I think it's a, a fascinating challenge for such a, a venerable and well-organized and effective institution when things start changing so fast that before you could even complete the documents, the analysis has changed. The costs are dropping for renewables 10, 20, 30 percent per year. Uh, and it's obsolete before the ink is dry. So in those circumstances, how do you manage risk? Uh, the risk of either doing what you did you wish you hadn't or not doing what you wish you had. You want to minimize both kinds of regret. And in times of rapid change, this is a supreme challenge to the kind of leadership and innovation uh, that we now see emerging at, at ADB. I'm going to have to take a couple of questions at a time now because we've got so many. So that gentleman there and then that lady there. Uh, Amory, Greg McGarvey, Australian Clean Energy Electric Vehicle Group. We're building an ecosystem around our vehicle uh, virtual storage. I'd be interested in your opinion on where that would go in the world and if there are any templates around that we can lift off. Are there any templates for vehicle distributed storage? Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, this is Kandika Vadhavan, Deputy Director from India. Uh, firstly, thank you for this wonderful thought-provoking session. My question is for Mr. Amory Lovins. So you made a wonderful presentation where you spoke about electric cars and the cost of batteries going down. But I have a very small observation in this regard. Very quickly, if you want. Countries will, like India and China, we are promoting electric cars. Electric cars run on battery. How are batteries charged using electricity? And how is electricity produced in our countries? 80% of the electricity has come from uh, coal. So in some sense, I have a feeling that we're just substituting gasoline or petroleum with coal. Okay. So what is your observation? Uh, I believe Niti Aok in India has just published a report uh, we, we helped with on the battery revolution and manufacturing batteries responsibly in India. Uh, and uh, if you look at models like the work of Professor Jodhanwala in India, or the Mobility House in Europe, you'll find some wonderful uh, business opportunities. In fact, it's now possible often to earn back half the, the cost of buying an electric vehicle by the grid services that it provides. 
which goes to the, the original question, which about is there a template for distributed um, electric batteries that, that, that you can point to anywhere in the world that's working? Uh, yes, well, the, the two I mentioned are, are among the most exciting. But oh, those, are the, those are the best ones. Okay. Yeah. Uh, last final couple of questions. There's a gentleman over there and then a gentleman over there. Please, go ahead. Uh, my name is Roberto Versola from the Philippines. We publish a magazine called Micro Renewables. I'd like to call the attention of the speakers to a debate that happened a long time ago in the computer industry. This was the debate between mainframe and microcomputing. A mainframe computing went after economies of scale in size, and uh, microcomputing went after economies of scale in volume. And we know which won that debate. It's the microcomputers that gave us the internet, the web, and the way we do uh, practically uh, uh, all business today. So uh, I'd like to ask the speakers whether you see the same kind of debate playing itself, itself out in the energy industry and whether you are truly considering that there can be much better economies of scale that can be attained if we approach it in the same way. Small scale, distributed, but lots of them to give us economies of scale in volume. Okay. Thank Absolutely. You. It's, it's about uh, economies of mass production and network uh, mathematics. But remember that now we have a supercomputer on our belts. It's more powerful than the mainframes used to be. And because battery life is so valuable here, the makers pay a very high premium for excellent battery technology. That then makes the electric cars possible. Those then build millions of batteries and make them cheap for all. So these technologies are actually very much related, not only the structure of the debate about what's the right size. All right, and the very final question there, because this gentleman's been waiting. Morning, Ferris um, Tanko from the Philippines. Um, I'd just like to ask, Fiesel mentioned something about putting matters into our own hands. So I'd like to ask, can we not tap into this voluntary drive alongside re-education, better media awareness, and youth impact inclusion, given the fact that we are looking for other drivers along, along or aside from the energy data that is currently available and the financial options that are also available in the market. And Fisa, just incorporate that with a, f a final few words to wrap up. We'll, we'll end up with a, with a final few okay. thoughts from there. And, and, and just incorporate it into your final statement. If you sure, 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 sure. So, um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, 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 what I'm going to be talking about after the coffee break is going to answer your question much better because it's more about uh, inclusivity. And uh, since, since the impact of energy has inclusive benefits with education, with health, with economic stability, with industrial growth, everything needs energy. And that's why the solution also has to have embed all the inclusive stakeholders in it together, be it gender, be it youth. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that ADB is also moving along those lines with gender including in one of the priorities as well as a youth ADB program. So definitely it has to be an inclusive solution to lead to, um, you know, to address this very integrated problem of energy. Okay. We'll look forward to your conclusions of the, uh, your presentation yes. a little later on. Amory, your closing statement. Almost everything we thought we knew about energy is turning out to be wrong. I was just reading an analysis yesterday that it's no longer true that solar is capital intensive and fossil fuel is not. Now, a solar plant and a combined cycle gas plant have identical cash flow profiles. Uh, so many of the assumptions we've made <coughs> are shifting under our feet. So we need to be very agile. We need to keep our eye on the economic ball to make sure we are delivering the most impact with the least dollars. And that will typically mean efficiency demand response, and modern renewables. Yeah, I, I'd like to mention two things. One is about uh, the uh, instruments we are using, modality we are using for our lending and grant operations. Uh, in addition to project-based lending, we are also doing a policy-based lending. And for instance, uh, in uh, Pakistan, we are supporting energy sector reform by using uh, budget support <coughs> type uh, lending uh, together with the uh, IMF lending. So. Policy-based lending is so important for changing uh, the uh, institutions or the ideas of government. In many countries uh, in Asia in 1960s or 70s, th those are so affected by socialist policies, state-owned enterprises and so on, and it was not so efficient. Although we need a government, uh, we don't need a government which is so inefficient. So we need uh, better policies in many countries and we're supporting the change of policies based on policy matrix uh, of energy sector reform, uh, PPP, uh, public-private partnership uh, 
uh, uh, uh, laws and so on. So we are supporting it. And also result-based lending in Indonesia, for instance, we are supporting uh, small off-grid uh, uh, the solar project through result-based lending, which is not to support project by project by our procurement system. They are using their own procurement system, but it is based on the result. It's like a policy-based lending, but it is based on the result, like uh, how many uh, households are supported by this uh, uh, funding. So we are, are doing all these things uh, together with the technical assistance. Another point I want to mention is I, uh, I, I attended the G20 uh, finance ministers and central bank governors meeting in Fukuoka, and uh, they uh, adopted uh, quality infrastructure principles of six principles. And one of uh, them is uh, resilience. We should make uh, the, our system uh, infrastructure more resilient. It's not just about energy, but it's about uh, transport, urban, and everything. So we should always think about resilience and also cost, uh, uh, the life, uh, 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 life cycle cost. It's not just one shot uh, cost, but we should think about how durable those uh, infrastructure development is. And of, co of course, environmental and social impact should be considered. And also social uh, kind of elements should be also considered. And I, I mentioned uh, one thing that is related to the agenda. So when we do project in infrastructures uh, in urban and uh, transport project, we should uh, 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 care the uh, facilities for women more than usual. And we should use uh, more uh, women's engineers in many uh, areas. So I even in case of a transmission project in Bangladesh, uh, we included the gender element uh, by having uh, the scholarship for women engineers. Uh, we still have a shortage of uh, engineers, uh, women's, women engineers in these countries, in most of the countries, including developed countries. So we, ta uh, we set the target of 75% of our pro uh, project to include the gender elements, uh, even if it is uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, infrastructure project. So uh, that is one of the uh, areas we should uh, uh, we, uh, ADB is uh, making contributions. And uh, once again, private sector is important and our non-sovereign operations uh, in Kazakhstan and uh, in uh, last year, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, we did the uh, renewable energy projects. Kazakhstan is a very oil and gas rich country, but they are still trying to promote the renewable using private sector. And that is very, uh, I mean, uh, the encouraging sign. And we are also issuing a uh, uh, local currency bond in Armenia, Georgia, and in other countries to finance private sector operations. Uh, so uh, those are also funding side uh, we are also using, uh, and also we are uh, issuing a climate bond or a green bond to, to, to finance, uh, in, to support the green finance. Thank you very much, President Nakao. And uh, I, I know we uh, had a number of people who wanted to ask questions. Apologies you couldn't, but uh, thanks for the engagement. And it's great to see so much energy in the room. I hope we take that into the rest of the sessions today and for the rest of the conference. It's been a great start. Please show your appreciation for this panel. And thank you for your engagement. And, and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you very much, President Nakao, who is really leading a transformative agenda here at the bank. Um, we'd like you to now enjoy your coffee and network uh, for around 30 minutes. We are meeting again at 11.10. While some of you are enjoying the coffee, we also have a signing ceremony with USAID, and we are asking, please, uh, requesting the press to move to Annex 2, which is on this side here, please, um, to um, accompany that uh, signing ceremony. Thank you very much for the first half of the opening panel. <laughs>